Thank you and welcome back everyone. I'm Hanna Birna Kristjánsdóttir. I'm the senior advisor on women's leadership with UN Women. I'm the chair of the board of the Reykjavík Forum and I'm also honored to be a member of the board of WPL. Along with Diana Keita, I have the pleasure to be one of the co-chairs of this session. It's entitled Leadership Recommendation. And as you could hear, dear aud audiences from our previous round table, it called clearly for all sectors to work together to ensure that new leadership has equal representation from women and men. And our session that we'll be following now will look at how women leaders will drive exactly that important transformative change. Recovering from a crisis implies learning new experiences to prevent another, another crisis. The leaders of our session here today will offer their insight, will share their experience and learning on what COVID-19 pandemic has taught their society, themselves, and what they feel we need to consider as we build back the new normal, which of course we all hope will be a better normal. So the final session of the roundtable discussion from the Women Political Leaders Summit 2021 gathers seven world leaders to discuss and answer one final question. And these distinguished leaders are Chloe Swarbrick, member of the House of Representatives of New Zealand, Gabriela Guevas Barone, co-host of the U UHC 2030 Steering Committee, Member of Parliament from Mexico, Honorary President of the Interparliamentary Union, and our Girl to Leader Patron for Latin America. Jackie Jones, Director and Chief of Staff, Gender Equality Office of the President at Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, her Excellency Jewel H. Taylor, Vice President, President of the Senate, Liberia, and she is our Girl to Leader Patron in Africa. Nurati Ali Asikaf, former MP, Indonesia House of Representatives, current President of the Geneva Council for International Affairs and Development. She is the member of the WPL Board and she is the WPL Global Ambassador for the Sustainable Development Goals. Rania al Mashad, Minister of International Cooperation in Egypt. She is our Girl to Leader Patron for Middle East, East and North Africa, the MENA region. Sandy Okoro, Senior Vice President and World Bank Group, General Counsel, the Vice President of Compliance at the World Bank. Before we hear from these excellent panelists, I would like to hand over to my co-chair, DNA. She is the Deputy Executive Director, Program, United Nations Population Fund, for some introductory word. Over to you, dear DNA. Thank you so much, Anna. Nice to be here. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all distinguished participants in this roundtable dedicated to leadership recommendation. We will delve into what is the new normal and how are how are women leaders driving its definition and building forward? My name is Diana Keita. As Anna said, I'm the Deputy Executive Director Program of United Nations Population Fund. And I'm truly, truly delighted to co-share this panel along Anna to discuss how women leaders will drive transformative change. It's clear, we must not accept the current situation as normal, nor must we take the pre-COVID standard as acceptable. When COVID-19 was first identified late 2019, it was impossible to imagine the scale of disruption and devastation that this virus would cause. The pandemic has exposed vulnerability and exacerbated inequalities within and between countries, hitting the poorest and most vulnerable among them particularly hard. The socioeconomic impacts of COVID-19 have adversely affected progress made across our shared goal, including gender equality. 
pandemic-related disruption could reduce progress towards ending gender-based violence and female genital mutilation by one third over the next decade, we could see an additional 13 million child marriage. More women and girls are at higher risk of having an intended pregnancy, which can derail their life path and dreams. The pandemic shines a harsh light on what we know to be true. Gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls is central to every single sustainable development goal. Women have played a critical role in the response to COVID-19 as frontline health providers, care providers, essential workers, and as managers and leaders of the response and recovery efforts. Yet, women remain underrepresented in leadership position and their rights and priorities are often not addressed. We cannot rebuild and restructure our economies, our societies, and our futures without women and girls. These same women and girls who are still waiting for the world's promise to be fulfilled. We must focus on the implementation for the, of the existing commitment of the program of action for population and development of the Beijing platform of action and of the upcoming generation equality forum. And we must demand more. I look forward to hearing from this distinguished panel on their recommendation on how to build back better based on your rich experience and how to ensure that women leaders are at the forefront of this change. Thank you. Thank you so much, TNA, for actually framing this in exactly the way we had hoped the discussion to go on today. So let's get started on that note. For the question for all of our panelists today is the same. And we are asking all of these leaders to answer the following questions. As an established leader, what is your recommendation to build a post-pandemic society that can thrive, given the lessons learned during this pandemic? How can we ensure women leaders are at the forefront of this change? So first off, we have Chloe Swarbrick, who is a member of the House of Representatives of New Zealand. Over to you, Chloe, please. Well, women leaders were at the forefront of responding to the pandemic. If we think about our essential workers, if we think about parents, if we think about those who are at the front lines and even the medical sector. Uh, so I think that that leadership has always been there. Uh, and in fact, one of the many lessons that we've learned is that we've largely overlooked it in terms of the value that we've ascribed to the work that different people and indeed that women in our societies do. When it comes to the role of the state or of governance, uh, I have a way of thinking about how we for so long have perceived the state as something that exists over there as apart from us or as apart from society, particularly civil society. But in fact, I prefer to see it as a manifestation of particularly through representative democracy, uh, the willpower of people, which has only ever improved, obviously, the more that people choose to engage with it and therefore the more diverse that it becomes in its representation. One of the other many lessons that we learned was just how uh, all of these things that we were told for so long were politically or economically or otherwise impossible. The likes of rent freezes here in Aotearoa, the likes of raising benefit levels for our poorest and most vulnerable New Zealanders, uh, the likes of flexible working arrangements for people with disabilities or for sole parents were able to be done overnight, <laughs> effectively exposing that this was never something that was politically or economically impossible, but that the barriers were those of political willpower. Which again takes me to the point of how important it is that our state and our governance is all more representative of society and of our communities and of uh, the different cultures and you know, at the very least half of the population being women. So when we talk about what kind of world we're moving towards, I think that the lessons and uh, the evidence bases that we could build solutions from were there prior to the pandemic, but the pandemic actually exposed just how uh, urgent these responses are. That is the likes of shifting away from a way of thinking about the economy in the frame of gross domestic products being the core or only key performance indicator. 
you know, gross domestic product when it was invented in the 1930s by Simon Kuznets uh, was a concept taken to the US Congress uh, where he effectively outlined that this was a way to measure economic transactions. But he himself forewarns that it should not be in any way, shape or form conflated with the measure of what he called the welfare, what we now call the well-being of society. The reason for that is that mere economic transactions and the measurement of them, even in mass quantum, cannot give you an indication of the value, particularly the social or environmental value of those transactions, nor the distribution of them. So to give you an example of just how flawed and problematic that thinking is, it's the case that GDP goes up when there is a natural disaster or when somebody gets cancer, when there is a car crash, because there has to be economic transactions in order to undo that social ill. So moving into a way of thinking where economically, particularly from the government's perspective, we begin to price or think about those so-called externalities that we for so long have continued to place on the bill of future generations and incorporating them into our thinking from the get-go. Uh, one of the many ways to tie these threads together, and I think, in fact, to lead to a far more progressive and feminist future. Thank you, uh, Honorable Chloe Swarbrick. I am honored to introduce Senora Gabriela Cuevas Baron. She is the co-chair of the UHC 2030 Steering Committee, member of the Mexican Parliament, an honorary president of the Interparliamentary Union, as well as Girl 2 Leader Patron, Latin America. She has been federal member of the parliament three times. She became the youngest and second woman, second woman president of the Interparliamentary Union. Estimada Gabriela, you have the floor. I would like to thank Women Political Leaders and its president, Silvana Kotmering, for the invitation to take part in the summit. As we have very short time, allow me to go straight to numbers and lessons. The global share of women in parliaments amount for 25.5%. 58 women as speakers of parliament, nine women as heads of state, and 13 as heads of government. The consequences, this is not representative. This is not democratic at all. Worldwide, 132 million girls do not have access to education. 630 million women living today were married before, before they were 18 years old. As of 2016, of the 15.4 million people in a fourth marriage, 88% were women and girls. Over 200 million girls and women have suffered genital mutilation. The consequences, an unequal present and future for violations of human rights are a common occurrence. But let us go to the solutions my lessons about leadership, and what I can share from my heart, brain, and personal history. First, we need to become a team, to work together for each other, break barriers for all, build new paths for the next generations, and in many cases, for our own generation. We need common goals, shared strategies, and strong solidarity. We must change the rules. This world was made mostly by men who imposed the rules, and their language. Yes, this is the time for inclusion and to work for a world made by women and men. But surely that begins by changing the rules and establishing new ones. Even today, 2.5 billion women and girls are still being discriminated by their own national laws. We need discipline. Leadership roles will not just come to us. We need to attain them. We need to speak up and be brave. Me Too has shown that we can speak up and hold those responsible to account. Together, we can fight violence and harassment. Together, we can fight and to have the laws and budgets that address needs from a gender perspective. We must translate international dialogues and commitments to national and concrete solutions, especially when it comes to gender equality and human rights. We need inspiring women that are fully decided to change the painful reality of unequal salaries and discrimination. We need more women in the financial and economic areas to bring real opportunities for women's development. Our planet needs leaders that learn to have empathy through their hearts, while at the same time making decisions with a scientific basis. We need women leaders 
who can be an example to girls and inspire millions of women. The post-pandemic recovery cannot wait. For a better world, we need all women and girls on board. Thank you, Gabriela, for your wonderful contribution in this discussion today. Next, we will hear from Jackie Do Jones, Director and Chief of Staff, Gender Equality Office of the President, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We are honored to have Jackie here with us today, sharing her views on these important questions. So please, Jackie, the floor is yours. Hello, I'm Jackie Jones, Director and Chief of Staff of the Gender Equality Division at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. In my role, I'm responsible for overseeing our external women in leadership programmatic strategy and internally striving for gender equality to be embedded into our global programmatic work. In my professional career, I spent years enabling public and private, large and small organizations to design and implement operating models that empower the humans inside the organization to realize their strategic objectives. In doing this work, I always prioritize taking a human-centered approach because I learned that to ch achieve change, you need buy-in from every person associated with that institution. Critically, buy-in also requires leaders to look like and care about the communities they serve. I believe lessons can be learned and borrowed from other sectors, especially right now, as we seek to rebuild economies with solutions that are inclusive. If we are not intentional and do not design with women in mind, we will design without them. This is a net loss to economic and societal progress. So how can we make this intentional design happen? By having women in leadership positions who are leading and contributing to our rebuilding efforts. It's clear that women have borne the brunt of the pandemic. As nations look to recover, they cannot ignore that COVID-19 has led to a rapid rise in women's poverty levels following two decades of relative decline. When we place women front and center of recovery efforts and intentionally design with women in mind, we will affect meaningful change. Right now, the voices of women political leaders are needed more than ever to drive forward policies for a more equitable world. If we are to change the world, including decreasing inequalities, addressing the care economy and enhancing women's economic empowerment, we need women in leadership roles and leaders who are committed to action. Our own commitment to women's empowerment started early when we realized we were not going to achieve our development goals unless we focused on women. At the foundation, we identify through data the structural barriers that women's economic empowerment and leadership unlock. When working with our partners, we set about making change happen. COVID-19 has laid bare and amplified the daily burdens of women, which is why the foundation cares deeply about unpaid care and the childcare crisis. It's left a personal impact on billions of women, but also structurally an imprint on national economies as women are forced to choose between caring for their children and earning a living. The Women Political Leaders Summit is timely, coming ahead of global commitments, including our own at the Generation Equality Forum, which culminates in Paris later this month. As a network of more than 12,000 global decision makers from around the world, Women Political Leaders is a force to be reckoned with, and today's summit presents such an opportunity for commitment and action. Thank you so much, Jackie Jones. Now, I have the honor of introducing Her Excellency, Dr. Jewel Taylor, Vice President of Liberia, President of Senate, Li Liberia, and Girl to Leader, Patron Africa. She has served her nation for more than 20 years in many capacity. Your Excellency, the floor is yours. I am Jewel Howard Taylor, the first female Vice President of Liberia a proud member of the WPL board and the Girl to Leader patron for Africa. The COVID pandemic has created a new world reality, which has shifted our old norms, our old customs and old ways of life. Though frightening, this shift presents new innovative opportunities for women across the world to better network, share ideas and be strong together. We must now harness all of our energies into being more vocal, more active, more involved, and more strategic in order to pursue and reach our targeted goal 
of generational equality in all spheres of national life. Women must no longer stand on the sidelines. We must each get actively involved in finding our passions, training, preparing, building, succeeding, becoming, and mentoring the next generation. It is time for women to step up, step out, and get actively involved, thus becoming the change we want to see. By being present, by raising our hands, and by amplifying our voices, we can collectively push until everything changes. I therefore commit to working for generational equality. We thank the Excellency Jewel Aids Taylor for those very much needed reflection. We are honored to have her with us here today, sharing her experience. Thank you. Next up, we have Nurati Ali Asikaf, former MP in, in Indonesia House of Representatives. She is currently the president of Geneva Council for International Affairs and Development, member of the WPL board and WPL's global ambassador for the sustainable development goals. The floor is yours, Nuriati. Hello, dear chair and panelists, and thanks to WPL for organizing this summit in very challenging times. COVID-19 pandemic is a global threat to everyone, causing death increased unemployment rate, inequalities, and miss out quality education. SDGs 2030, with the ultimate goal, leave no one behind, remains the best framework to massively scale up international cooperation, highlighting the importance to end poverty, protect the planet, ensure good health and well-being, and be more inclusive toward peace and justice for everyone by 2030. Therefore, post-pandemic society should revert to inclusive society within SDGs framework to ensure gender equality and equal opportunities to everyone. Regardless their race, religion, and ethnicity, they have the same opportunity in life. To support inclusive society, we need policies and action with the system to guarantee equal access to public services, as well as enabling citizen participation in decision-making process that affect their life and to educate society as a whole in achieving SDGs 2030. We need stimulus package for recovery after pandemic, which should be designed to minimize the widening social gaps and to guard against creating new form of exclusion. We are aware women are the front for, sorry, forefronts of the battle against the pandemic as they make up almost 70% of the healthcare workforce, exposing them to greater risk of infection while they are underrepresented in leadership and decision-making process in healthcare sector. While women have been hardest hit by COVID-19, they are also often leading the way in building forward better. Many women entrepreneurs have responded to the incredible challenge with both greed and innovation, befitting rapidly to cope with the impact of the crisis and help create better futures. Data shows comprising only 8% of political leaders globally, women have account for an estimate 40% the most successful response to COVID-19. New York Times columnist Nick Christoph comparative analysis point out that women-led countries have a six time lower death rate than those led by male counterpart in similar countries. Because in nurture, women have compassion for putting people's life first, transparency, flexibility, and willingness to admit mistake, clear, consistent communication, and encouraging values of cooperation and empathy. I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nuriati. I have now the pleasure to introduce Madam Rania Almasat, Minister of International Cooperation of Egypt and Gertu Leader, Patron, Middle East, North Africa. Good morning, everyone. 
It's a pleasure to participate in the Women Political Leaders Summit this morning with an amazing variety of women from all over the world. Uh, it is a good start to note that 2021 is the year of historic consequence as we are all learning from lessons through the pandemic. And one of the key lessons has been the importance of multilateralism. Uh, multilateralism is increasingly networked and efficient. It also calls for more inclusivity. We need to build societies which are gender blind, uh, and that is the only way that we can make uh, gender or women's participation macro critical, not just uh, for women, but also for societies as a whole. Moreover, communication has come to the forefront of the pandemic as more communication instills trust uh, and credibility, uh, not just uh, between government and citizens, but also between citizens. According to the World Bank's Women, Business and Law 2021 report, women still have only three-fourths of the legal rights of men. And that, uh, according to the World Economic Forum, uh, is due to uh, less women being in uh, positions of power. Uh, that's why uh, it's very important to push uh, this uh, agenda, the agenda of uh, empowering women in political positions. As Minister of International Cooperation, we work with all our multilateral and bilateral development partners uh, to create collaborations on this point. We are, and this is uh, one of the examples, uh, such as pushing for initiatives like the Girl to Leader uh, pattern uh, to encourage next generations of women leaders. Uh, it is our duty to help support uh, the next generation uh, of leaders. Uh, for many years, men have mentored and supported one another, and it is time for women to do uh, uh, to do the same, trying to make sure that some of the prejudice that exist or the fights that we have had, maybe the future generations will not need to go through. Women in Egypt are playing a larger role every day. Uh, today, we have uh, more than 25% representation in parliament. Uh, also, uh, uh, 28 ministers, female ministers in very uh, important uh, uh, portfolios. Uh, and this type of influence is what actually inspires and pushes uh, other uh, girls and ladies to dream uh, that they can uh, move forward. Um, gender parity and equality is at the core of what the government uh, believes in, and it's part of Egypt's sustainable development framework. Uh, according to the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Report 2021, uh, Egypt has closed 63% uh, of the overall gap, jumping five rankings uh, ahead uh, this year, and that is on the back of the increase in parliament's representation uh, from 14% to 27%. Let me conclude by saying uh, the future is female. Uh, there is now an opportunity to develop a new strategy of intelligent multilateralism, and that is uh, truly going to be the right answer for us going forward. Uh, global economic situations require uh, inclusivity. That is all us should participate, men and women. Uh, women's participation does not only affect them, but affects society as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your reflection, Minister al Masat here today. It is now time to hear from our final panelist of this great group of women leaders, Santi Okoro, Senior Vice President and World Bank Group Council and Vice President for Compliance of the World Bank. The floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Um, uh, it's great to, to be amongst you. Um, we have seen how um, COVID-19 has dealt an unprecedented setback to the worldwide efforts to end extreme poverty and reduce inequality. And we all know that um, women and young girls have um, always um, been at the receiving end of um, the worst, the most, the most extreme um, uh, effects of extreme poverty and inequality. So where it affects men, it affects women much worse. Um, and so we, we also know that in this pandemic, decades of advancements in um, development, in development outcomes have been set back. So we can't just take the steps forward that we have taken, we have to spring forward when it comes to improving women's economic empowerment, ec economic empowerment um, voice and agency. So we, we cannot um, sit back and, and, and rest on this. We really have to be very, very particular in how we move forward. Um, the World Bank, for example, has estimated that about 150 million people will fall into extreme poverty by the end of 2021. And this is a direct result 
um, of the pandemic and it will hit the, the poorest and the most vulnerable um, um, in, in this sense and women even more so. Um, so we have done a lot at the World Bank in terms of funding and providing funding um, not just for the vaccines and treatments and healthcare, but also to ensure that the, 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 the decades of gains that we have made in the development space do not go backwards, particularly those for women and girls. And um, I just want to say a little bit about access to justice and equality. This is core as well. And, and, and this has suffered too in the pandemic. And, and we really need to ensure that going forward, we address these issues. Rule of law, access to justice will be absolutely core. It is actually, um, you know, lack of access to justice is a central dimension uh, for pos pov poverty. And we have increasing evidence that it plays a critical role in effective and strong institutions, which is what we need for peace, for equal rights, for opportunities, and to make women's lives um, better. So um, there's a lot to do. We shouldn't be pessimistic. But in all of that, we must remember that women are generally 50% of the population. So they are 50% of the solution. So they must be in 50% um, percent of all um, um, the conversations, solutions, everything. They are the other half of the equation and you won't get your answer without them. So we have to, in this post pandemic society, in order for us all to thrive, it's not just about women thriving, for us all to thrive, they have to be in the decision making process. In homes, in their local communities, in society at large, they need to be in everything and they must not be excluded because the world as a whole, our governments as a whole, our institutions, you name it, will not really succeed and will not have the innovation, will not have the, the tools that they need without accessing that amazing uh, 50 percent. So getting equality, women's economic empowerment, getting them to the table in leadership positions is essential. Um, but we mustn't think it will just happen organically. We're going to have to make sure that happens. And for us here at the bank and the work we're doing, that's really in the development space to make sure what we have lost, we regain really quickly and then some. So we have to do this. We won't reach our goals without it. And um, so the work so that the, we support the work that's being carried out by the network of women um, political leaders. This is so important, but we mustn't forget the most vulnerable and the poor because they have something to contribute here, particularly women um, in, in, in those categories. So let's let's go for it. Let's see a more gender equal world that thrives to its fullest potential. Let's be the best we can be. Thank you, uh, Sandy. Thanks all distinguished panel members for their insightful responses. There is so much to learn from the flexibility, adaptability, agility, and ingenuity of the response to COVID-19. We have many hard-won lessons to inform future strategies and ensure no one is left behind. I do want to share my own recommendation on how to build a stronger post-pandemic society and create a better normal. This can be achieved when we listen and respond to science and evidence and support the gathering and effective use of quality disaggregated data. When we focus on bu building resilient and integrated health system and support human development, because the most important source of resilience lies with people themselves. We work to ensure that gender equality is fully integrated into strategies, policies, and investment moving forward, addressing the root causes that creates barrier to women's ability to make decisions about their own sexual and reproductive health and rights, promoting bodily autonomy for all. We ensure that women and youth are empowered to meaningfully participate and influence the response, recovery, and development of the better normal. And finally, we must ensure that these policies are costed, accounted for, and supported so that they can be implemented. Allow me to highlight a few key points from the panelist presentation before closing. The pandemic showed us the importance of willpower, commitment, and multilateralism. Women and girls have carried the disproportionate burden of the pandemic. A post-pandemic society must be designed with women in mind. 
women must no longer stand on the sidelines. It is time for them to step up, step out and get actively involved, thus becoming the change we want to see. I thank you and pass now the floor to my distinguished co-chair, Anna, for her closing remarks. Thank you so much, Diana, for being here today and for co-chairing this. And thank you so much for all the work that you have been doing in your role, both, both professionally and personally. Uh, thank you so much. It's greatly, greatly valued. And thanks for summarizing the discussion we had today with our leaders. I absolutely agree with uh, the framing of DNR here around what was basically the message from our leaders today. I think we all see that women have been hit really hard by the pandemic. We also see that we have been stepping back, sadly, in some of the figures and facts and realities around women in leadership. We are still in a low number when it comes to how many women lead the world compared to men. The picture of a leader is still a traditional one and we need diversity, parity and balance in order for us to be moving ahead. So I think that is a clear message from all of our leaders here today. I also think that the urgency around the call of women leaders in the conversation at our summit this year is clear because we must also, there is always an opportunity and in every hardship and in every crisis we have, there is an opportunity and now we have the urgent opportunity to build back better. Not only to build back, but to build back better. And we can also hear the echo in the voices of our women here today saying that they see what UN, for example, the Sustainable Development Goals, the generation equality that is now being sort of currently the main issue around gender equality for the United Nations and the world. We can hear echo of these voices saying this is where we need to move from words to action. And I think this is the time to do that. And that has been that is why it has been so great to listen to all the leaders speaking at, at the summit this year in making sure that we reflect on that. Beijing happened 26 years ago. It's now time to move into real action. And we will not be seeing building back better unless we see parity, unless we see women in the same number represented in political power, in decision making across the world. Uh, and this is the world we want to see. And not only, as DNA mentioned, for the women of the world, but for the girls of the world. So they can see that their opportunities are the same as for boys. And this is why we need to make sure that that happened. So on those lines, I am grateful for the conversation we have had today. It's inspiring and it's of course powerful to listen to all of the leaders. We are excited to hear what we will have uh, later installed for you at the Women Political Leaders Summit this year. And thank you so much for tuning in and please make sure that you continue to stay tuned. Thank you so much.